where, where are the maritime crossroads out there? Uh, I laid that down. We, we got together and laid that down. And they're indicated here by these things. If you're an engineering major, the vowel symbol. If you're an English major, that's a bow tie. <laughs> and you can pick either one where it goes. I had a guy this morning say, well, I was an English major, went nuke. So I got it. I absolutely got it. So this is wonderful how, how this worked. But look, the Panama Canal is going to be widened in the not too distant future. So what does that mean to the Caribbean? I don't know. But one thing I do know, we need a place down there that we have to sustain, and that's Guantanamo. And certainly this is the, the people in this room understand the value of Guantanamo Bay with its deep water port uh, and with the airfield down there. Uh, if, if, as you go over toward Europe, we, as you well know, we've been invited and we're going to take them up on putting four DDGs in Rota, all right, out, out there in the future. Rota is a place for us. You go into the Mediterranean, you've got Suda Bay, Siganella, Naples, places in the Mediterranean. Suez Canal, very important. Get on here to Djibouti. Uh, Commandant and I, Commandant of the Marine Corps and I sit down the last two amphibious ready group, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit uh, briefings came in and they said, if it wasn't for that airhead at Djibouti and the port, we'd have been in trouble. We had so many ops going on down here and up here in the Gulf of Aden that uh, it was very helpful having that there. So Djibouti is a place. Of course the Strait of Hormuz, and of course Bahrain uh, as a place to operate forward uh, in the future. Uh, a place. Uh, Diego Garcia, it's more than SSGN's doing upkeeps there, although they do that now, but the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force is interested in doing an upkeep there, and we're interested in, in facilitating them to do that. The Strait of Malacca, obviously very important, and the Singapore, the country of Singapore has offered us the opportunity to forward base uh, some literal combat ships through, I should say, operate from Singapore, forward combat, uh, excuse me, literal combat ships in the future, and put the infrastructure in place to enable us to do the mission package change out there. Great opportunity down here in Southeast Asia. And Darwin, you may have read about the fact the President and the Prime Minister of Australia have agreed that we will work to rotationally deploy Marines out of Darwin. But there's more. Uh, in conversations with the Australians, uh, there are air, airheads and naval bases in and around that entire northern and western reach where the Australians are interested in having a conversation to decide what may the, be the art of the possible there. Uh, so a place, Darwin. Uh, I don't have a place up there with the Philippines, but we have been doing maritime domain awareness flights out of Clark Air Base, you know, good old Clark Air Base there, <laughs> monthly out in the western Pacific. And there may be some opportunities to do some more activity uh, in and around the Philippines with the Philippine Armed Forces. Of course, Okinawa. Of course, Yokosuka, Atsugi, Sasebo, Misawa, and Iwakuni uh, in Japan in our future. Uh, we deploy out of Guam. It's a base. We deploy out of uh, Hawaii. It's a base. And you can see the other bases listed here. Now, I've laid up here for you ships. And what this represents, in the morning I go to work, I get in, get, this, uh, get in this dark SUV with the smoke windows. I can't see out. You can't see in. So that's how you, you look at your Blackberry and your book. So I've been doing that. I got sick of looking at the Blackberry. So I started actually looking at the book that they gave me in the morning. And I noticed through the weeks that we go through where the Navy is distributed. And what you see up here is probably within about 10% uh, where our ships are located. So to do quick math, you got 285 ships in the Navy, give or take one or two over the period I've been here as a CNO. You got about 100 deployed uh, on any given day. And so you can see, it's real easy, right? The denominator is 100, the percentage of where they are. That's where we're distributed today. These are both coasts for what that's worth here. And uh, this is about what we have. It varies a little bit on, uh, on the cycle, depends on the fleet response plan and who's deploying in the future. That's the lay down uh, today. And I would tell you as I look out there, uh, this resonates pretty well with defense uh, planning guidance that we have, st defense strategic guidance. And as you look over the next few years, some folks say, well, what, how is that going to change? You know, how will the guidance? It's not going to change dramatically the, what, where our focus is. There's not going to be a big swing over the next couple years that I see right away. This is about right. About half of those ships in the Western Pacific our four deployed naval forces. They're out there permanently. They're high end. Our air, that's the best air wing we have with the best ordnance, with the best ASW equipment. It's got the best lot of, of strike fighters 
and those cruisers and destroyers uh, are about the best we have. We, they're probably the best maintained and, and most ready forces out in the Western Pacific. We are ready for this defense uh, strategic guidance and this plan, um, ready to operate forward. So shortly after I took the watch, uh, I said, well, I better get out of here before all these budget deliberations. And so within the first week, uh, we went over to see where I thought it really mattered. We went to Japan, then we went to Korea, and we went to Bahrain. Uh, Japan, I think, is our primary partner, clearly, in the Western Pacific. Uh, and very, very key to the security out there. So a few takeaways, sitting down with my counterpart, who interestingly enough is a service warfare officer, who interestingly enough, when I was out there as a 7th Fleet Commander, ran their submarine force. How about that? He did a pretty good job, too. But don't be getting any ideas. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. All right. But he said, uh, we agreed on a couple of things. One, we will be operating in the South China Sea. That's that's what we're about. We're gonna, we'll do it together with the ROCs, ROC Navy, Republic of Korea Navy, when they're ready. And we need a common set of protocols of approach there uh, among our, our two navies. In other words, uh, if there's interactions, there will be some chit-chat there between us and maybe the, the PLAN. Uh, what, what is the method by which we will communicate? What is the consistency of that method? Uh, so that we are together operating in sync among ourselves and with the, uh, the PLAN. Uh, the JMSDF thinks uh, they're going to be moving into this to the South China Sea and Southeast Asia independently, establishing their own relationships. They've done it predominantly through us up through this time frame, and they feel very pretty comfortable about getting out uh, from just the area in and around Japan. In fact, they have re kind of reoriented what they view their, their area of concern from just in and around Japan to Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Mideast. So it's gotten kind of big. Some would call it there, they call it the banana that kind of runs a swath right through here. Uh, that is their new area uh, of concern. So we agreed to continue information sharing, and if those of you that are familiar with that, it's very dramatic, it's very high end, we, we share a lot. We are co-located now in many of our headquarters in Iran, Yokosuka, and up there at Atsugi at what we do. Tell you the effects of the tsunami, and the, uh, and the nuclear uh, incident that took place after that uh, have receded quite a bit, and things are getting pretty much back to normal. Well, I saw it in Yokosuka on the base, as among our folks, as well as in the relationship. Uh, Admiral Sugimoto said, you know, um, we consider you no longer guests here in Japan. You are neighbors now. And that's a big move uh, in that culture to move from that area. So, uh, that's a little bit about that relationship. Over to Korea, they are uh, very much concerned about uh, North Korea provocation and their response. The Korean Navy is very much into literal ASW right now because of the Chonan uh, incident that took place and that lo the loss of that ship. We were working on helping them look into ASW and do a deep dive of their processes, their systems, uh, and things of that nature, and it has changed the, the way they've come about, what they want to order, what they want to buy. They were moving very blue water uh, up till shortly before this point. And uh, now they've got to make sure they're comfortable with uh, their internal features in and around the literals before they move again. But make no mistake, they are an emerging partner in ballistic missile defense with their KDX-2, and they will continue to be, to be so. Went to Bahrain after that. And uh, the Arab Spring is not over from, from what I saw there. Uh, it is uh, kind of quiet but strained. Uh, we, as you probably know, have taken some diplomatic action. It's, it's really a matter of uh, our respective uh, uh, State Department and Ministry of Interior there uh, and how we see things from mill-to-mill -mill engagements, some form of military sales. Uh, but overall, committed to the relationship. Bahrain is important. Don't really have a plan B uh, in that area of the world right now be beyond Bahrain uh, with NAVSENT. They have a Bahraini independent com uh, commission uh, on inquiring into the outcome of, of those, uh, uh, those deliberations for uh, the commissions or court and that that took place. And uh, I think that is a good start and that will um, hopefully help clear this issue up over there and we can really move on from there. While I was there, I took a, uh, went out to the John Stennis, great ship, doing a great job. Some of you may have read about what they did with, uh, uh, with uh, pirates and Iranians and helping the Iranians out, getting the release 
If you haven't, you got to go back and read uh, the Weekend New York Times. It just so happened. How, isn't it amazing how this works? You know, we've got a team of New York Times reporters embedded on board. They uh, say, hey, it's time to wake up. What's his name? Who was uh, not feeling well after his Hornet flight? And they said, hey, you got to go up there and do a familiarization ride on a helicopter. They said, OK. So he gets him on a helicopter, and this thing just kind of unfolds uh, right in front of it. And uh, next thing you know, they're on the Dow with uh, a Lieutenant JG, surface warfare officer, running the show overnight with pirates and Iranians on a Dow, showing what our people do, our sailors left to their own devices, did magnificent work. And if you uh, read the articles, you'll know what I'm talking about. Wonderful job. So I learned uh, my ride on the, on the Stennis. We went through the Strait of Hormuz. It was a wonderful, clear day. One of the best days they say they've had. Of course, that's because I was there. But uh, no, seriously, and environmentally. And uh, I got an Iranian naval review. It was uh, wonderful. Saw Yono, saw Kutches, saw small boats, large boats, Corvettes, uh, F-27s flying over, an old P-3 that went over there. Uh, some of you would have been proud. Didn't see, didn't see that F-14, though. We couldn't get that one up. And uh, it, gives you, it gives you the picture of when we talk about you know, the straits, the constraints that our people were operating under. Uh, it helped me set in my mind the kind of things I thought we needed to do when I got back. And so we'd made some movements in the budget in the area of mine warfare, counter swarm. Uh, defense of ASW and others that I thought were necessary, and, uh, and so we took that on. So anyway, the folks are doing a good job over there. Um, so 